I want to turn the lectern over to Vince to introduce uh, our speaker tonight, uh, Dr. Michael Pollack, who I understand will, uh, he has a slide presentation on shoulders specifically, but uh, you're free and welcome to answer any questions about hips, knees, and whatever moving other parts we have of the body. Uh, Dr. Pollock is open to to take questions. And Vince, it's all yours. Thank you. Again, we are welcoming um, Dr. Pollock. He's been uh, nominated three times for the best surgeon in New Jersey. Tonight, he's going to be talking about the start, the state of the art of orthopedic parts that are being replaced, leading to the bionic generation. Doctor? Good evening, everyone. It's, it's an absolute uh, pleasure to be here and be with you. I'd like to keep this as conversational and informal as, as possible. My name is Dr. Michael Pollack. I work uh, as part of an 18 physician uh, multi-specialty orthopedic group. Uh, and we have an office about 10 miles down the road and uh, on Route 22 West, you may have seen it, Bridgewater. Uh, when I started out, there was three or four of us and we've expanded to 18. Uh, orthopedics is basically six different subspecialties. The bottom line is we can take care of just about anything from the neck down uh, from a musculoskeletal standpoint. Uh, if it's above your neck, uh, I can guide you to great providers and practitioners, but that doesn't necessarily uh, fall within our, our purview. Uh, I uh, have a particular passion for the, the shoulder. I did a shoulder and elbow and sports medicine fellowship. And I, what I would say is one, don't hesitate to raise your hands and ask any questions about any orthopedic uh, issues, maladies, questions, concerns. Uh, we'll keep this informal. But what happens with shoulder, as with many joints, is the basic principles are the same. Uh, and what a lot of people don't realize about orthopedics is there tends to be an overemphasis on surgery because that's what uh, is, uh, is fascinating and, and provides patients with great outcomes and results. But really 95% of what we do is non-surgical and we pride ourselves on that. So you don't have to worry about what surgery you may or may not need. When you come in, we're going to treat you without surgery. And often uh, the vast majority of the time gets you better without surgery. And if you don't get better without surgery, we're happy to tell you everything you never want to know about surgery. But for the most part, uh, I think as human beings, we like to avoid anything painful and bases or surgical, but of course we can take great care with surgery if it, if it comes to that. So just to give you, again, basic principles uh, do apply uh, in shoulder. So um, if you haven't had a shoulder problem uh, to this point in your lives, uh, I think you will at some point. I, I treat patients from 10 to 100. And uh, the beautiful thing about being an orthopedist is whoever you meet, I always have something to talk about. Because uh, it's, and I always tell folks, I mentioned to someone earlier, you're better off spending time with me than with your cardiologist. So let's let's keep you active. Let's keep those joints aching and we'll take care of that. And this way we keep you healthy otherwise. So uh, let's just go back for a sec, uh, Bruce, to the original slide. Yeah, so this is true pretty much across the boards. Uh, in the course of our adult lifetime, uh, up to 35% of us will have pain in the shoulder. Uh, that's what I do day in, day out. I see dozens and dozens of people with uh, varying types of shoulder, knee, elbow problems, and do general orthopedics. I see just about everything. Next slide, please. Uh, so, um, you know, we will get x-rays. Uh, the vast majority of the time, x-rays don't show much, but there's a couple different areas. The shoulder, one of the reasons it's so fascinating to me is it's basically four different joints. It's a ball and socket joint. It's a joint where your uh, collarbone articulates with the, uh, the top of the shoulder blade, which is your AC joint. Your... Um, Shoulder blade articulates with your rib cage. That's called a uh, scapulothoracic joint. Uh, and then also where your sternum and your clavicle articulates. So shoulders, basically four joints. But uh, there's typical pathologies. And the typical things we see are pinching of the rotator cuff and soft tissues. It's called impingement syndrome. It's a combination of bursitis, tendonitis, bone spurs. We'll all get it. Uh, it's putting my two kids through college. I'm happy they're in college now. Uh, it just started my empty nest. And... Um, Frozen shoulder is also a very common problem in the ball and socket joint where the shoulder's stiff. There's no way you could really, I had a frozen shoulder, I had trouble diagnosing myself. There's no way you can really self-diagnose these conditions. It's easy enough if it's not you, but when it is you, it's hard to tell. So, you, so you'd have a tough time differentiating between impingement syndrome, tendonitis bursitis, inflammation, and a frozen shoulder. 
And x-rays help us make sure our frozen shoulders and an arthritic shoulder. Next slide, please. So that's what it looks like. That's the bony anatomy. Uh, so just, um, you know, uh, the four different joints here, just, just to give you that. It's fun. Next slide, please. And now you can see the soft tissue anatomy. So when people talk about the rotator cuff, what that is is a collection of four tendons that surround and stabilize your shoulder. Cuff represents four, the coalescence of four different tendons. So you get a sense of that there. Um, it is, it's essential for a pain-free movement of your shoulder. Most folks have heard of the term rotator cuff or impingement syndrome continue. And a little more of a sense of the anatomy, uh, bony soft tissue anatomy, biceps tendon, continue please. Uh, so one of the most interesting things about the shoulder is referred pain. So people said, why are we talking about my shoulder? I heard here, why are we talking about my shoulder? Well, that's called referred pain. So your brain gets tricked into thinking. So the pain is often originating from the region of your shoulder, but you feel it here. So what I, I've gotten the habit of doing is said, well, um, you know, tell me about where your arm hurts. Because if I ask, tell, ask somebody where their shoulder hurts, they, they're automatically saying, well, it's not my shoulder. It's my arm. It's my biceps. It's my deltoid. It's my triceps. Well, typically, if you're hurting here, it's coming from your shoulder. And that's true in a lot of joints, right? So if your hip hurts, it's oftentimes your groin. If your back hurts, it's often your, your leg or your buttock pain rating down your leg. So those are called referred pain distribution. So your brain gets tricked. There's an overlapping nerve distribution. And while I may be thinking shoulder, you're thinking my biceps, my triceps, my deltoid. So that's called referred pain. So you can see those red dots represent referred pain distribution. So if you all come into my office and say, I'm hurting here, whether you're thinking or, or not, I'm thinking your shoulder. Let's continue. Pinching is one of the most common conditions. So if, if you or one of your neighbors or colleagues or loved ones is complaining of shoulder pain, guess impingement syndrome, 90 plus percent of the time, you'll be correct. That covers a constellation of symptoms. I have some good handouts. Uh, anywhere from just inflammation uh, to the full spectrum of complete tearing of multiple tendons. So that's impingement covers a, con a continuum of just inflammation, which is pretty straightforward to tearing, which sometimes requires surgery or a prosthesis. So if you guess impingement, you'll be right 90% of the time and you sound smart. Continue. Again, just more of the same, uh, lots of different terminology, but basically uh, the most common condition that I see and is probably seen in orthopedic offices. Continue, please. So, um, yeah, if you hurt longer and you don't intervene, you may be stuck with uh, a more invasive treatment. So if you're hurting more than a few weeks and you're not responding to Tylenol and or some anti-inflammatories, better to get it checked out so we can nip it in the bud and, and prevent you from needing something more invasive. Continue, please. Most folks that get this can't pinpoint what they did. Sure, uh, it's mileage. You know, we don't talk about age. We talk about mileage. So use and abuse over time. Very, if you fell, uh, maybe a tear will get an MRI scan. Vast majority of the time, uh, same thing with hand and wrist problems. We have uh, elbow problems. We don't know exactly what caused it. We just know that we beat ourselves up and uh, we're active. Maybe we sleep on it funny. Maybe we're working at a desk. Maybe we had a demanding manual job. A lot of us do white collar jobs and still have these types of problems. Continue. It's much better, again, to be active, to have good posture like mom and dad taught us, and to walk and to have aching joints than the alternative. So the answer is always exercise and being active, even though it's good for business for me, it's, it's better for all of us. Continue. Again, the vast majority of what I do is non-surgical, and I got plenty of surgery to do. I do over 500 surgeries a year but I see over 5,000 patients a year and I'm more than happy to take care of everybody without surgery because that's the right way to do this job. Physical therapy, shots, um, a variety of different injections, 
um, lifestyle change, activity modification, PT, home exercises, the vast majority of the time that does the trick. Um, so we spend a lot of our surgical and our residency training learning how to do surgeries, uh, but that doesn't mean that uh, everybody needs a surgery. In fact, most people do not continue. So it just gives you a further sense. People always ask, what's a bursa? A bursa is really just a, a potential uh, space that helps lubricate the spaces between tendons and bones and ligaments. And if it becomes pathologic, it just gets inflamed. And so a lot of I spent a lot of time injecting uh, the bursa beneath, uh, on top of the rotator cuff. That's called the subdeltoid or subacromial bursa. Uh, and that's a lot of times what causes people grief. People have sort of... Um, a disproportionate fear of corticosteroid injections because nobody likes the idea of steroids. Cautious. Oral steroids are a great resource, but have a lot of side effects. And mo many of us know people have been on oral steroids and have put on weight or have had some complications and side effects. Injectable, thank you. Injectable steroids are a great and incredible resource, save a lot of people from pain, disability, and surgery. They just have to be used judiciously. So we shouldn't conflate those two things. Oral steroids, necessary sometimes, but a lot of side effects. And injectable steroids, very safe if used judiciously. Uh, people always, I'm not going to do them every week or every one month, but if you do a shot and it works and somebody comes back a year later, that's a no brainer. So for me, um, it's a great resource that's not to be feared. It's just to be treated with the healthy respect, like all types of treatment. Continue, please. So exercises are a key part. And uh, if you come into my office, you'll get a variety of exercises taught to you, depending on the condition. Uh, many of you use extra bands, tubing to strengthen different parts of your body. Uh, there's just specific uh, strengthening exercises, extra bands we use to build up the muscles around our shoulder blade. There's 17 muscles that connect to our shoulder blade. You build those up, you can save yourself a lot of grief. So band exercises are generally a first-line treatment. Continue. And that just gives you an idea. You've seen them, you've done them. Uh, just uh, most folks who come in know how to do them. We just need to reinforce them and emphasize the exercises that are appropriate for a given condition. So those are, um, and bands really... Uh, uh, once we hit 40 plus, work as well as free weights. And if they're used the right way, uh, you don't need to be pumping up a lot of heavy weight. In fact, if you're doing a lot of heavy weight, that's good for me, but not as good for you. So sometimes just higher reps, lighter weights is the way to go. And bands are a key part of that. Continue. So early rest and then uh, get going. Uh, excessive rest is almost never the answer. Um, and uh, PT can be critical. We've got lots of great therapists in, in this uh, vicinity. You throw a stone, you'll hit one. So we can always direct you to a great physical therapist. Continue, please. Yeah, and the vast majority of people, 80 plus percent can be treated successfully without surgery. A lot of people postpone treatment because they're so fearful that they're going to come in and we're going to tell them we need surgery. Well, if you're seeing uh, the right type of doctor, and most of us, I think, are are pretty ethical and scrupulous. We're not going to recommend surgery. And so don't, don't not come in. You can always choose not to have surgery, but don't come in because you're afraid you're going to be told you need surgery. Uh, most of the people I talk to are just so happy that I tell them they don't need surgery, uh, but don't just delay treatment because you're fearful. Someone's going to tell you that uh, because you don't have to do it, even if uh, someone tells you to do it anyway, but we're not going to usually lead with that up front. Continue, please. And yeah, more uh, anatomy. So frozen shoulder is um, common in folks over 40, uh, a little more common in women. Um, it um, is a condition where the shoulder is just horribly stiff and gets stiffer. It's just what it sounds like. Um, one of the pitfalls of folks who don't do uh, take care of shoulders day and out, like I do, is it's easy to miss it. So that's just a little different condition. But again, if someone's asking you what you think's going on uh, and you want to um, sound knowledgeable, just guess impingement syndrome, tendonitis, and uh, frozen shoulders. Uh, are a rarer entity, but still quite common. Continue. And, you know, there's a freezing phase, a thawing phase. Uh, the vast majority of people don't require surgery. Uh, and typically folks in the 40 to 60 age group continue. How uh, you can continue. Again, natural history of most things is if you just ignore them, they'll get better. But that being said, three to four weeks into pain that prevents you from sleeping, get it checked out and we'll help you sleep better and get you feeling better quicker. So don't, don't suffer silently. You can live with it. You just don't need to, but 
most everything, you know, we've got a great network of primary care physicians in the hunter and healthcare system. Most of the time I see folks, they've been counseled by their primary to take Tylenol, to take anti-inflammatories, to rest a bit. So by the time we see folks, um, they're not there to tell me how good they feel. They're there to, to uh, for me to give them some suggestions on how to feel better. But if two, three weeks, it's reasonable. Two, three months, you're probably suffering needlessly. Continue. Continue, please. So frozen shoulder, the key point here is it's a more of a stretching program. I'd have to help you make, or we'd have to help you make that diagnosis because you don't want to be strengthening in a stiff and frozen shoulder. You just make yourself worse. It's like banging your head against the wall. So that's where uh, a little bit of expert advice uh, comes in. You, you can figure out how to do exercises, but if you don't have the right diagnosis, it's hard to come up with the right treatments. Continue, please. And injections are also a valuable resource in a frozen shoulder. Continue, please. That's what a frozen shoulder looks like. We put a scope in, look in arthroscopically with a fiber optic camera. I shouldn't be putting a fiber optic camera. That's not my picture because then we've missed the diagnosis and you, you don't need to treat this surgically most of the time. So I don't know who did that, but it wasn't me. Continue. Uh, this is something that's just kind of uh, cutting edge. So uh, a lot of us who follow sports hear a lot about something called platelet-rich plasma. Raise your hand if you've heard of platelet-rich plasma or PRP. It's a hot treatment. Uh, it's also something insurance doesn't cover. So guess what? A lot of providers like, like to lead with it because they can charge an arm and a leg for something you probably don't need. Um, it's a good resource. It's a good treatment. Uh, we read about professional athletes getting it, but a, a well-timed, well-placed corticosteroid injection works um, a lot better than PRP and Medicare covers it. So silly to pay out of pocket for something you don't need, but it is a, a nice treatment. Uh, and there's a variety of applications. Happy to take any questions regarding that. We spin the blood. We have a special machine in the office concentrate the healing factors associated with uh, the platelets, use your own biology, very appealing conceptually to use something that is your own biology, your own anatomy. You can see why uh, it's popular and there's data to support it. I'm, I'm not against it. It's just not, uh, it's not plan A or even plan B, it's often plan C. But if it saves somebody from needing surgery, we're all for it, continue. And again, um, there's a, there's a, uh, a limited set of scenarios where we're doing this in the shoulder, not because it's unsafe, just because it's expensive and we don't want people to pay out of pocket for something that they don't need. Uh, works better in folks who have inflammation than folks who have partial tearing, as you would imagine. Continue. Thank you. So uh, I would love to open the floor to any questions. Uh, I'm, a, I'm trained as a general orthopedic, so not just a surgeon, I'm a surgical subspecialist. Uh, I have lots of patients I've cared for for the last 20 years who uh, insist on seeing me, and um, I'm happy to see anybody for anything at any time, especially if I have history with them. But I'm not the last word in the hip. I'm not the last word in the back. I have partners that are fellowship trained in that. But I can uh, I can help answer your questions, and I can care for help you understand these conditions. And if you need an injection in your back or your hip, or a surgery in your hip and back, God forbid, um, we've got folks for you. Um, but I'm happy to answer any questions you have about anything related to orthopedics. And the most important uh, words that a physician knows or I don't know. So if I know the answer, I'm going to be honest with you, but uh, I can help you. So I'd like to open the floor to questions and uh, and help you. And I'm going to ask uh, this gentleman here first because he caught me on the way in. He said, his question is, I'm going to I'm going to predict it right now, is what are the signs and symptoms of a meniscus tear? Is that your question? Right. So like a lot of things in orthopedics, so, so the meniscus is a soft C-shaped cartilage disc that sits between the bones in your knee. It's not something you see on x-ray. That's why everybody says, I need an MRI. Why do I need x-ray? Well, it's true to some extent, but you need x-rays first to put things in context. If you have just x-rays, you're half blind. If you have an MRI, you're half blind. So x-rays show us bony anatomy. Uh, and a lot of us, once we hit 40, have some bony findings. M uh, MRI shows soft tissue anatomy. So the meniscus is a soft cartilage discs, kind of the consistency of your earlobe that sits between the bones and your knee. There would be no necessarily way that we could self-diagnose a meniscus tear because the symptoms are nonspecific. Pain, stiffness, oftentimes mechanical symptoms, so locking, clicking, catching, popping, focal symptoms. So my right knee, this would be my medial meniscus. This would be my lateral meniscus. Guess what else causes pain here? Arthritis. Guess what also causes pain here? Arthritis. How would you know? You wouldn't. That's why, that's why I always have a job. So uh, there's no way, unless you have an MRI machine in your kitchen or an x-ray machine, 
that you could probably self-diagnose. There's medicine is really pattern recognition. 80 plus percent of, of being able to diagnose people is talking to them. X-rays are great. MRIs are great. But if you, if each of you came up to me and said, here are my symptoms, I could probably pretty accurately tell you what's going on. So meniscus tear, there's way too many meniscus surgeries being done. Uh, so, uh, if I got an MRI of say a hundred people here, 60% of you would have asymptomatic meniscus tears. Does that mean that 60 of you in this room need, uh, surgery on your meniscus? Absolutely not. Um, what we treat are symptomatic meniscus tears. Most of us have degenerative meniscus tears. So the long answer to your question is, um, meniscus tears that cause focal findings, medial or lateral, don't respond to other forms of treatment, create mechanical symptoms, locking, clicking, catching, popping. Don't respond to other forms of treatment like PT, convincing looking MRI, clean looking x-rays. Those are the folks that need meniscus surgery, but most of us don't. I probably avoided thousands of meniscus surgeries just by doing an injection and explaining this to folks. So, um, you know, when people, I have a lot of patients that go to Florida for the winter. I've been treating them for years. They come back from Florida, they had a knee scope. Guess what? The knee scope didn't help them. They don't have a relationship with their doctor. It's easy enough that you can put a scope in anything. doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. But uh, there is a role for meniscus surgery. When we say we uh, fix a meniscal problem, a lot of times what that means is we're not repairing the meniscus. We're removing a small torn piece of meniscus. So we're fixing the problem, but we're not fixing the meniscus. Our younger patients, our athletic patients, certain types of meniscus uh, tears and patterns do lend themselves to actual repair. But more often than not, it, you're fixing the problem by taking out a small torn piece of meniscus. As you can imagine, it's like having a hangnail in, you know, or a pebble in your shoe. You can imagine it's not ideal to take out a piece of anything if you can avoid it, but just sometimes it's necessary. Any other questions about meniscus problems or whatever? Please go ahead. What other questions? Yes. Is that your husband sitting right next to you? Uh huh. His knee, knees. Is that your husband sitting right next to you? Yes. Well, lots of things. So it's very, what's that? We're gonna talk about, it. I'm gonna tell you everything you can do. It's a great question. So. Um, it's cal the, what's that? Okay. So the issue in question is stiff arthritic knees. What can we do? Probably the most common thing we talk about and see. Okay. So the intuitive thing is to take it easy. That's the worst thing you can do. If you rest, you rust. She's giving him the look. So I can, I can give you all kinds of little one-liners, you know, motion is lotion, but the bottom line is this always listen to your wife. That's the best way. But keep moving, okay? Right. It's hard. My job is to get rid of your pain so you can keep moving. You're, you're svelte, you're slender, that's good, okay? Every pound above your ideal weight you are causes five to seven additional 
pounds of pressure on your knee. That's not your issue. Okay. You got to push through the pain. My job is to help with your pain. So that's why if this has been a more than a few weeks or more than a few months, years, come on in. Doesn't have to be me uh, and get some injections. Then you're going to feel better. So you can do all, you can keep moving. And then it becomes a virtuous cycle instead of a vicious cycle. Because you imagine you don't walk, you're in pain. You get a little blue about that. Your muscles get weaker. You put on weight, it gets worse. So we want to turn a, a negative into a positive. Get rid of your pain. Then you can get going better. You push yourself and you realize, oh, yeah, uh, walking and exercising isn't the problem. It's the solution. But it's very easy for me to say exercise. It's very hard to do when you're in pain. So I got to get your pain under control. So typically, we would start with injection therapy, corticosteroids, hyaluronic acid, PRP, usually in that order, different types of shots, get x-rays, confirm that you would have arthritis. Maybe you have a meniscus tear. Probably not. Uh, but again, the treatments are generally the same. So Tylenol, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, over-the-counter. Most people, by the time they get into my office, have done that already, but sometimes they don't do it the right way. And then shots. Gel shots are good. Well, uh, then we have to look at those x-rays and, and maybe he's a candidate for knee replacement. He could consider a PRP injection. Well, it depends what the x-rays look like. So we don't treat x-rays, we treat people. I got people with bone on bone who are very spry and don't need surgery. I have people who have significant arthritis, not bone on bone, that should have had surgery five years ago. So bone on bone is only part of the conversation. It's also, um, are we able to tolerate a surgical procedure? I do knee replacements on people in their 70s and 80s all the time. It's not the number, it's your, your physiologic age. You know, if you're well, it's a lot of folks in their 80s gonna live to 100. Why should you suffer for 20 years? So, you know, you, you have to fail all those, check all those boxes, which you have, and then you have to reassess sort of where you're at. If you can live with things, that's great, but you may be at a point where you either live with it or consider having an operation. It depends on, what your x-rays look like for sure, but it doesn't have to be bone on bone. You certainly need a considerable amount of arthritis. Um, but sometimes when people say, oh, you don't have bone on bone, it's their way of saying, I don't think you're a good candidate for surgery. And that may or may not. Well, what I usually say to people is if a surgeon says don't have, don't have surgery, generally speaking, don't have surgery because we're, we're trained monkeys. We're trained to do surgery. So if we're saying don't have surgery, we probably have a pretty good reason for that. That being said, um, you need a more, maybe a little better explanation than what you're getting. You may not be a good candidate for surgery for any variety of reasons, but you've done all the things you should do before surgery. And if you and your wife agree you're suffering and your quality of life is going south, and you're having more bad days than good days, it's worth the conversation. So get another opinion, and I'm happy to render one. They may all say the same thing, and I, you know, and they may say, listen, you're on 15 medications. They may say, your arthritis isn't bad enough on x-ray. Again, to me, that's not the main thing because we treat patients, not x-rays. Uh, and there may be a reason that uh, a lot, that a bunch of docs are telling you that you have no other choice, but when you started with your question, it seemed as though he hadn't had a lot of treatment. He's had a lot of treatment. It just ain't working. Yeah. No? Right. So you've had a, you've had extensive treatment. So then the rubber hits the road. You live with it, and which is not what or you have, or you consider having an operation. There's an operation that, that would probably work for you. There's probably a reason why some folks are telling you shouldn't have it. But again, you know. My colleagues tend to do surgery sometimes when it's not the best idea. If they're telling you not to have surgery, there's probably a pretty good reason. But that's the story. What else? Yes. Yeah, so there's, there's some basic misconceptions about over-the-counter medication. So Tylenol, acetaminophen, is sort of in a category unto itself. It's very safe. You could rarely do a lot of harm by taking Tylenol unless you have sort of end-stage renal disease. So Tylenol is a pain medication. It's not an anti-inflammatory. You're rarely wrong by trying some Tylenol every six hours as directed. Tylenol, 
A lot of people say, well, Tylenol doesn't work that well. Sure, that's true for some people. The next category of medication over the counter is non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medication. Does anybody know what those are? NSAIDs, sure. So uh, ibuprofen, Advil, Advil, Motrin. What's the difference between ibuprofen, Advil, and Motrin? Anyone? Not a damn thing. The, the mistake that the same difference, right? Now, what it takes to get an anti-inflammatory dose of a non steroidal medication, Advil, ibuprofen, Motrin, is eight to 10 pills. Who wants to take eight to 10 pills a day? I don't know anybody. That's too many pills. So in order to get an adequate anti-inflammatory dose of the medicine, it's hard. So my thing is, why not just take a leave? Because that's a, a more potent non steroidal anti-inflammatory. And you can take two twice a day and get the equivalent of eight to 10 Advil, Motrin, or Ibuprofen. So the mistake most people make is they don't take enough Advil, Ibuprofen, or Motrin. Not that you should do that unless you need to. They also confuse non-steroidals with Tylenol. They're not interchangeable. Advil, ibuprofen, and Motrin, to your point, interchangeable. Aleve, same type of medication, just stronger, so you need to take less pills, easier to dose. So my thing is take two Aleve twice a day, two with breakfast, two with dinner. And that's a cheat to take basically a prescription strength anti-inflammatory without having to bother with the doctor. So to me, that's Aleve's great. It's just a great medication. Um, but know that those are pain pills and anti-inflammatories. Tylenol is just a straight up pain medication. By the time you walk through my door, probably none of that stuff's working too well because everyone, most everyone in this room knows, knows to try that, knows to do that. Um, so I'm happy to counsel patients on those types of over-the-counter medications, but most everyone knows to do that. They just don't always know how to dose it. So again, in order to get an adequate anti-inflammatory dose of Motrin, Advil, Ibuprofen, same difference, you need eight to 10 pills, 1600 milligrams. No one's going to take eight to 10 pills. I mean, I'm sure you all take eight to 10 pills to some, but not, it's not one medication. It's a bunch of medications. So that's just not practical. I've got a lot of athletes. They don't, they don't want the nurse to administer non-steroidals to them. The parents want to give their kids a little something with breakfast and a little something with dinner and not worry about it. So that works for all of us. So leaves nice. And you're almost never wrong trying Tylenol. It just sometimes doesn't work. And if this stuff doesn't work, you know, then we talk about other things. But those are the two major categories over the counter medications. What else? Sure, sure. So I think um, partial knee replacement is a wonderful operation in the sense that it preserves some of your anatomy. The problem with it is most of the time when you have your husband, for example, I'm sure, most of the time, when you um, present and you're ready for surgery, you fail to share treatment, you have arthritis in all three compartments of your knee. So a very small subset of people are indicated for partial or what's called unicompartmental knee replacement. So um, it's easy enough for a surgeon to do a partial replacement on somebody. And then when they're, they're knee, they develop arth further arthritis in the other parts of the knee five or 10 years later, it's not the surgeon's problem anymore. It's your problem as a patient. So if you're 60 years old and you have any evidence of arthritis in more than one compartment, and I can do a knee, total knee replacement with the expectation it lasts the rest of your life, it's a disservice to you to do a partial. You're not gonna be mad at your surgeon when your knee fails in five to 10 years, maybe you will be. But what I wanna do is something that works and is durable. So I would say anywhere from 10 to 20% of people are well indicated for partial knee replacements. The best patient in my mind is a 50 something year old person who's going to need a second operation anyway. So I'm going to do the partial in their early 50s, get them to 60 or 65, and then we can do a total. If you're in your 60s, very rare that a, a partial makes sense. 60 and beyond. And the 60 is young these days, right? I mean, so um, it's not that. But there's a lot of gimmicks in orthopedics because to try and, oh, ultrasound, um, stem cells, if you're seeing something in, in bright lights on TV, guess what? It's, it's something that's lucrative, but it's not necessarily something that makes sense. Robots, partial knee replacements. There's lots of ways to things that are exciting on TV that, that have a role, but shouldn't have, they have an expanded role in, in the public sphere in terms of marketing because there's something, oh, partial must be better than a total. 
It's only better if it's the right operation for you. And the majority of the time it's not, but it's a, it, it's a well-accepted, well-established treatment for a sm much smaller subset of people with knee arthritis. So here's what I would say about arthroplasty. Arthroplasty, you need 10 years of data before you want anyone to put that in. You do not want the newest, shiniest thing because the orthopedic landscape is littered with new technologies that are two years, five years, and 10 years fail. And they say, you don't want to be a guinea pig. You don't want something experimental. Knee replacement was developed uh, by a name John Insall, brilliant guy in New York City about 60 years ago. His original prototype and design has not changed radically. There's always new materials. What's gotten better about knee replacement is the materials, the rehab protocols, the pain control. But the, the fundamental uh, design and basics of the operation have not, it's, it is not a, um, a new technology. It's a mature technology. You can be very careful with somebody trying to sell you something new, um, especially in joint replacement because you need 10 plus years of data to prove that something's better. And most of the time, it's a company that's pushing something that's off patent, that's good for the company, it's good for the medical industrial complex, it's not good for you. You want, I can, if I can put in a knee replacement that's cemented, and I can tell you there's a 90 plus percent chance it's going to last 20 years, that's the knee you want. There's 15 different uh, implants that are great, that have a track record. I'm not saying the one I use is better than the other 14. I'm just saying you have to be careful with the latest exactly. and greatest. There are latest and greatest things that do have appeal, but it's our job to put it in context and be honest with you about what that is. So if somebody wants a knee replacement that's only been around for a couple of years because it's got new bells and whistles, I would explain to you that that's not a great idea. So what's new and exciting? Um, in a lot of a lot of my colleagues in a lot of fields, robotics has really panned out. Um, Skull-based surgery, low pelvis surgery, cancer surgery in your throat and neck. What robotic technology has done in orthopedics is it's driven up costs. It takes us longer to do the operation and has not added any provable benefit. So um, a lot of times it's a marketing gimmick. The minute, if I thought something was better, Provably better. I would not, I don't care how much money it costs uh, if that's going to be better for my patients. But we also have to think about things globally. And if something is not provably better and Medicare has a fixed amount of money and we're using something that's ex exceedingly expensive and isn't helping anybody, that's not good either. So, um, but again, if I think something is more expensive but better, oh, let me give you an example. So we have a, uh, when I do rotator, so rotator cuff tendons tear because the area doesn't have a good blood supply. So about 30% of people who have large tears that get surgery, re-tear to some extent. So what we now have is we have a patch that is derived from uh, bovine collagen. So the bovine Achilles tendon, we have a patch, they take the, they denature it. And we put that patch on after rotator cuff repair and it decreases the re-tear rate by about two thirds. That patch is very expensive. I'm thrilled to put it in the right patient. I don't care how much it costs. So um, that's a really great technology advance that's been developed in the last five, 10 years. Early on, you said it's a good idea. I think it has a lot of promise and potential. I'm going to try that. And then once you get data to support it, you know, I'm all in on that. So somebody who's older, has a large tear, has had previous surgery, um, has certain suspicious finding on x-ray and MRI. I'm going to put that, I'm going to spend that extra $4,000 to put that patch on. That's great for the company that's on the patch, but more importantly, it's, it's the right thing for my patients. But to spend an extra four, five, ten thousand dollars $10,000 on something that has no provable benefit and may even be worse, it's like insult to injury. It's bad for society. It's bad, you know, bad for all of us. Other things, PRP is kind of a, more of a cutting edge treatment. Again, um, there's some evidence it's better in knees than say like your husband had gel injections. Some evidence it's a little better. But if you came into me, I'd say, try the gel shots first. Your insurance is gonna pay for it. Um, if it doesn't work, we can always have you pay out of pocket for PRP. So there's things that are have a little bit more evidence to support them, but then you have to be practical. Is it worth spending 750,000 bucks out of your pocket when something is close? And insurance covers it. So there's certain practical considerations into using technology too. But our our healthcare system is amazing for specialized care, 
but we we're spending three times as much money on people and we're not delivering uh, necessarily better outcomes or better metrics. So our system is, and is broken in some fundamental ways in terms of how we overspend for things. So we have to be responsible in terms of our spending, not that we're going to deny people treatments that are expensive, just uh, we have to be smart about doing it because people feel like I'm getting better care because my doctor is throwing a new technology at me. But the reality is they're not getting better care in some situations. And then it's bad for our kids and our grandkids that we're, we're breaking the bank. Which one? Yes, knee replacement. Yeah, so so this is another thing that's just been sort of distorted. So um, you can't put a new engine in your car with your hood half open, right? Right. So you can imagine if we're putting in, so first of all, the person who developed the knee replacement was a genius and it's been an incredible gift to humanity. The one thing they did wrong was the naming of it. Marketing disaster, knee replacement, it sounds terrifying not a knee replacement. We're not cutting off a huge part of both ends of your knee. It's a knee resurfacing procedure. So knee arthroplasty, people who need knee replacement won't get it because the name sounds so uh, scary and radical. It's really a knee resurfacing procedure. Still, the implants can be five, six, eight millimeters in width or depth or length. So tell me how are you going to get that in there through a small incision? You're not. So um, that's just been kind of a non nonsense. Whether you cut ligament, tendon, or muscle, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you cut. It matters how you cut it and how you repair it. So that's been nonsense, and that's been disproven. So again, you know, you have to find a surgeon you like and trust and let them explain to you why they do what they do and trust them to do it. Uh, anterior hip replacement is, a, is something that you all probably heard about. The benefit of an anterior hip replacement uh, hip replacement is one of the best operations that's ever been developed for anything in terms of satisfaction and success rate. If you get it done from the side, lateral, the back, posterior, the front, anterior, you're going to be happy. If you had an anterior hip replacement, you're going to think it's the greatest thing in the world and you're going to attribute it to the approach. You know what it should be attributed to? The skill of your surgeon and, and making a good choice to have surgery. So I have partners that do every single hip approach. They're all great surgeons and they all get great outcomes. But anterior hip replacement's been kind of played up you may feel better a day or two quicker, may feel better a day or two quicker, may bounce back a little quicker. But again, it's just something new and shiny. It ain't wrong if you can do a great job. But what I would do is pick a surgeon you like and trust and let them do what they do. Yes, sir. I don't think so. Yeah, I think a muscle relaxant will sedate you. Um, but it's generally not getting at the root of the problem. If you are having acute symptoms and miserable, there's a role for a muscle relaxant. But generally speaking, they're habit forming. Uh, they they sedate the heck out of you, and they don't do a lot of good. So there's lots of other good ways to treat sciatica uh, and ridiculous symptoms. But uh, muscle relaxants, to me, are not at the top of the list. Yes. Sure. So the first thing I would say is this. So my dad is, I'll tell you a little anecdote story. My dad was an orthopedic surgeon for 50 years. It's my family business. Pretty sophisticated healthcare consumer. Had urinary retention, went to an urgent care facility. You want to get great care, generally don't go to an urgent care facility. You need them, you need them. He said, it was so wonderful. They, they did an ultrasound and scanned my bladder to see how much urine was in my bladder before they put a catheter in. I said, Dad, why do you think they did that? Because they can bill an extra 500 bucks for the ultrasound. Do you, do you think they needed to do that ultrasound, Dad? So he was impressed and felt cared for because they did something that was unindicated. So what I would generally say is this. If something is shiny in neon lights, be skeptical, okay? I get questions from people all the time, these types of questions. If it's advertised on TV, they have a big advertising budget. So the, what so, someone's going to tell you is there's a doctor in my community that's PRP for every problem, every for all the time. You know why? Because it can charge a thousand plus dollars out of pocket for it. Why is he going to give you something that your insurance covers or that is cost effective? 
because that's just the mindset. So if something is uh, being pushed on you, including surgery, um, in a way that feels gratuitous, you know, uh, you have to, you kind of uh, have a health, I'm sorry to say this, you have to have a healthy skepticism. Um, unfortunately, medicine is a big business and that's what happened. So just uh, if something doesn't make sense, get another opinion. My job is very simple. Just be honest with people. That's the way I was raised. Uh, just be honest. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to be straight with you. You know, some people, you know, there are, there are shiny, exciting new things that have merit, but a lot of things, if it doesn't make sense to you, get, I'm very blessed. I have a lot of doctors in my family. I can get a second opinion by picking up the phone. I'm getting texts and calls all day from people asking me questions about things where I can connect them with the cardiologist and other things. But some of us don't have that luxury. So if you're not sure if something doesn't make sense, get another opinion. And maybe you're going to get a different answer. And if you get the same answer, then there's your answer. Uh, I'm not saying you have to sh doctor shop. I'm just saying that if, you know, trust your gut. And if something doesn't seem reasonable, it's probably not. And you don't want to come to that realization after you, there's no problem that can't be made worse with surgery. We've all seen people with failed back surgery and failed operations. Figure that out before you have an operation that's not necessary. Uh, the doc, you know, when I started out, there's three of us. Now there's 18 of us. The main uh, criteria for doctors that I've hired and I repeat all of them is good character. You know, don't, don't do something, don't recommend something that you wouldn't recommend for a loved one. So, you know, I wish I could stand here and say that all surgeons are honest and they don't even wake up and think that they're being dishonest. They're just, the incentives are screwed up in our system. It's like somebody looks in the mirror and they think like, I'm, I'm a bad person. No, most people don't. They don't even realize it. They don't even realize that they're doing things that are uh, against the oath that we took. So we have to, you know, check ourselves and be careful. And if something doesn't make sense to you, feel empowered to, you know, get another opinion. That's all. Yes. Yeah, it's a great question. I get it all the time. So uh, what I was alluding to before is it's generally not. It depends on what the nature of the problem is. So if you have end stage or serious arthritis, cortisone is not going to last more than three months, four months, six months, a year. But that's still three months, four months, six months, or years worth of relief. If you have arthritis, the only cure is uh, ultimately an arthroplasty. Um, it's not a Band-Aid if the condition is an inflammatory condition. So, right. All right. So, so let's, let's game this out. Okay. Somebody uh, is in their early fifties and they go every three months, six months or a year to get an uh, injection, corticosteroid injection. They're not going to keep going if they stop working, if they don't work then they have an operation, but maybe it, it bought them five to 10 years of good quality of life before they need an operation. So that's not a failure, that's a success. What's a failure is doing a steroid injection every couple of weeks or month, and it's not working. But most people are not gonna allow somebody to do injections if it's not constructive. So to me, it's a very valuable resource that helps a lot of people. If you have tendonitis, bursitis, inflammation, I do a steroid shot, we literally can cure you. No brainer to try that if we can cure you. But a lot of folks who have mild, moderate, or even severe arthritis benefit from steroid shots every three months, six months, a year. And there's no big downside. If it ultimately doesn't solve the problem or it's not working, sure, there's other options we talk about. You can try gel injections, hyaluronic acid, PRP, or have a surgery. But just because somebody ultimately needed surgery doesn't mean the shots didn't make sense. It just depends on the, the context. Right. We talked about that too. So um, I wouldn't do corticosteroid shot every week or every month. There's no set amount of steroid shots. You can get cortisone shots you can get, but you shouldn't do more than three or four a year. And if they're not working, you're not going to get them anyway. So it's just, though, that's a big misconception. They're very safe if done judiciously. What does that mean? You should not get steroid shots every week or every month, every three or four months if they help you. Great. That needs to be supplemented with gel shots. Great. But yes, um, there's no set amount you can get. We'll do them until they stop working. But at some point, they can stop working.
Right, so two different issues. So generally, spine problems are either cervical, your neck, or lumbar, your lower back. Mid-back problems, you know, a little less common. Um, generally, uh, those types of problems manifest as arm or leg pain or buttock pain. We all have, you know, some paralumbar, paracervical type pain, you know, like in the neck. There's lots of treatments. The natural history of those problems is within six to eight weeks, you're going to get better. And we just have to, you know, get you comfortable as you do. So the vast majority of neck and back pain should just be treated conservatively and you'll get better. Way too much neck and back surgery being done. Way too much. Uh, the reasons why, you know, it's probably beyond the scope of this conversation, but, you know, you can you can surmise. But yeah, uh, when somebody's miserable, uh, they'll let you do anything to them. But the vast majority of neck and back pain does great with over-the-counter medications, PT, and judicious use of you know steroid injections. That's that's very true for hernia discs. The reasons to have um, back surgery is because of progressive neurologic deficit, intractable pain that's not responding. But a lot of people with herniated discs and sciatica do great with PT and shots. The vast majority. If they help you, I'm all for it. Yeah, just don't let them do any vigorous manipulations. Anything that helps you, I'm for it, as long as it's not going to harm you. So, um, you know, they can help. And they can help you ride out that discomfort of those problems. Because I said, if you can hang in there six to eight weeks, your chiropractor plus your acupuncturist plus your physical therapist plus maybe your orthopedic surgeon can just keep you comfortable so you're not miserable. Because if you're miserable enough and it's not treated, you'll let somebody do an operation that you may or may not need. I suspect that Dr. Collins. I suspect that Dr. Pollock is available for individual consultation once you call his office. So <laughs> thank you very, very so much. So one, one quick uh, uh, promotional note. Um, our, we have a scheduling staff of about eight people. You don't have to understand what your diagnosis is before you call. They'll, they'll get you in with somebody great who can take care of you. Uh, and if, uh, you know, I've been at this a while. I've made lots of friends along the way. If you want to see me, I'm happy to see you. But I promise you, if you call and you need help, I've got somebody great for you. It doesn't have to be me um, who has the same values. So you don't have to know what the problem is. We'll help you figure it out. Nice to meet everybody.